that she is the professor of psychiatry and she is the director of the uh, Monash Alfred Psychiatry Research Center. Uh, she is a huge inspiration for me personally. Uh, she works in the area of uh, women's, mental, women's mental health and has uh, in hundreds of publications and she has attracted numerous grants and she is a great teacher and a great clinician great researcher. We are hoping that she would find a pill for body. <laughs> I think I might have to sit no down. Pressure, yeah. No pressure. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> First of all, um, thank you very much, Sophia. That's really lovely. And uh, I'm really, really sorry about um, holding you up on, a, on an evening like this. I just, um, I left an hour and 15 minutes to get across town from the Alfred, but that wasn't enough. So uh, next time I think I might walk. <laughs> um, I am going. To, I've got a very sort of ambitious title here, and um, I would hope that you'll agree with me more about what needs to be done. And, and I know a lot of you are working um, in the area, and Sakya has been an amazing um, uh, elder statesman in psychiatry for this area and this very needy group of patients. I do call people patients, I don't mind clients, consumers, women, patients, whatever. And so, you know, please excuse me if I'm using language that you don't particularly normally use. This is um, the story of Emma, and it's not her real photo and it's not her real name, but you will recognise Emma's. So Emma's a, a woman who um, basically uh, often cuts her arms and wrists and says that this makes her feel alive. She really couldn't complete school. She said she was unable to concentrate, has a bad memory and often feels really empty inside and often looks dazed. Emma also has angry outbursts over minor things. Um, she's now 26. She was raised by her single mother and her father left when Emma was only five years of age and she was sexually abused by her mother's boyfriend between the ages of eight and 14. She told her mother about this and her mother didn't believe her. Now, um, when I gave evidence at the Royal Commission in, um, in the last year, uh, or anyway, about the uh, violence against women, this was one of the issues that many of our clients have said it's the double whammy. Not only is there the horrors of the actual abuse, but then there's the invalidation from telling a particularly entrusted um, parent or um, other family or friend who then doesn't believe. So there's the double whammy that was described in the box by many of the victims who gave evidence. She um, left home at uh, age 16 and has a history of amphetamine abuse and also alcohol abuse. And they're the symptoms that she's currently experiencing. <coughs> she is very overweight and she's made 11 suicide attempts and has had four admissions to psychiatry wards, not with any great um, outcomes from any of the admissions. So as is no surprise to everyone here, the diagnosis that's made is borderline personality disorder, which is a DSM-5 diagnosis. I really think this is a useless diagnosis and we have many, many of our um, clients and I'm sure you have also uh, women who say things like, well, what on earth is it? You know, do I have something? This is so typical of you psychiatrists. You can't make up your mind, you know, it's on the border of do I have something or not? And one woman said to me, you know, it was bad enough when I tried to get my family to believe that I had something wrong. Now, you know, the term that's used also invalidates me because it just tells me that, that you're not sure that there's something going on. And the other part of that is the personality disorder. As one lady said to me, she said, so the thing that makes up me, the essence of me, is disordered. I've got nowhere to go because I'm stuffed, was her comment. And, and you know, really, Hearing that from years of, of um, practicing psychiatry with this diagnosis, which also, as you know, is not actually given or discussed very often um, with, with our clients because it is that sort of secret that often is written in letters or in discharge summaries or whatever, but no, very few times in the general public uh, mental health system and also in private 
you know, very often the, the, the woman, and I'm speaking about women because I've got women's mental health clinic, is like there is something I don't understand, you know, no one's actually told me what the diagnosis is. So for a lot of reasons, particularly when we consider the huge amount of stigma that is attached to this condition, there's a sense of blaming the, the patient or the client, and there is also a very strong sense of therapeutic nihilism. So the sense of, oh yes, okay, well this diagnosis has no treatment, really has no solution. It's just um, bad behaviour, bad behaviour, and that's all that there is. So there's nothing we can do. I think even if we've been told about this in theoretical frameworks, this has been ignored, the relationship of trauma to borderline personality disorder. There are many, many studies that have described about 85% of people with the condition experiencing, in particular, early life trauma of a severe and can be of a chronic nature. And this, this is something that, for some reason, we've lost that connection. And I think it's because of the, the kind of piecemeal histories that are taken in the public system. Um, so a woman might present <coughs> to the emergency department exactly with Emma's situation of having done something to herself. And somehow um, that previous story of her own awful childhood uh, trauma has not followed her around. And she's also obviously not wanting to reveal this to all and sundry, or else she's denied it and sort of put that away. But the mismatch means that this particular history of the trauma doesn't seem to actually uh, fit in terms of what on earth happened to this poor person that they've ended up with this particular problem. The early traumatisation and attachment disturbances, and that's, only, that's a term that we don't use much in everyday ordinary psychiatry, but it comes from an analytical framework, which is about the attachment of the primary carer and baby. Um, and that can often be disturbed for all sorts of reasons. And this isn't blaming the um, parent or whoever the significant carer is, but something goes wrong so that the trauma can go from, as, as we know, the spectrum of trauma from sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, attachment difficulties and um, disturbances, you know, right through, all leading to a spectrum of different symptoms within this catch-all um, big group of symptoms. So just so that we're on the same page, we're not talking necessarily about trauma as only one thing. We're talking about trauma as a vast array of different things, you know, including sexual, physical, emotional, humiliation, observing uh, violence, um, having any threat to one's physical integrity, which could include things like having a very sick or ill parent who the child is fearing is going to die or, or disappear and so on. So it's quite a big uh, word when we talk about trauma. I recently published this in the Australasian Psychiatry Journal because when we think about ICD-11, let's forget about the DSM system. There's a lot that, you know, is really horrendous with the DSM system. <laughs> Um, I was actually invited before DSM-5 um, onto the working party for um, this particular borderline personality disorder and I tried to talk about the trauma aspect and it was completely vetoed. Mm -hmm. Vetoed by the vet American veterans lobby who um, <laughs> were very clear and said things like PTSD is the province of the veterans, you will not muddy it with this patient population, it's just a completely different condition and it was shut down. So that's why DSM-5 really has had no consideration of trauma. So ICD-11, which is due for release, we think probably now October of this year, um, and I'll put this in a graphic form, there's a lot of words that go with the classification systems, but um, I, I take heart with it because while we have the... Um, this circle here, you can see that BPD still exists um, in the personality disorder section, but only a bit of it. A lot of it is actually encompassed in the PTSD and is called complex PTSD. So the blurring of the trauma PTSD sectors in this condition, I think is a really positive step forward. That doesn't mean that um, you know we rush around trying to desperately um, 
find that trauma and, and go into some sort of more veteran mode. But for a number of our clients, even that discussion about the trauma or getting our um, mental health staff to turn their heads around, to start thinking about taking a trauma story from the patient, um, go back to first principles and actually you know, get past the behaviour and actually think of the, the, the actual person and what has gone on in their longitudinal life is a significant step forward. And this kind of framework does allow us, because the minute we've had people, um, and I'm, I'm speaking to people who are experts in this field, so we <coughs> know that the problem is once somebody gets into that personality disorder box, that's it. It's like in the, in the general hospital, different in your setup, because that's what you do, but in, you know, in the general hospital system, it's like the kiss of death on a general ward, an emergency department, and even in the psych, psych wards, that's the kiss of death. If you've got a personality disorder, you really, nothing further is considered other than you're just behaving badly, we just need to get you out of here, um, stop gumming up the works, all of those kinds of pejorative things really do kick in, which is just shocking. So this, when we run it past some of our clients who have, you know, living with the condition, um, a, a quite a number of, of the women, and again I work with women, um, have been very clear to say they find this very comforting, that it even opens a dis door to think about different sorts of therapies that might be effective. So what do we know about the condition? We do know that it's highly prevalent, and 5.9% and are people who have been officially diagnosed and officially have um, uh, impacts in terms of either their, <laughs> their working life or their relationship life such that it impairs their functioning. So when we actually extrapolate out where the condition might be, not the full disorder, but actually the person has features, we actually end up with a figure that's much more like about 19% of the population. So as you know, this is a very highly prevalent condition and it really does have huge levels of mortality and morbidity and health service use. So again, the occupational dysfunction, the, the, the chronic self-mutilation and suicidal behaviors <coughs> are all very severe. So it always, it always reverberates that you know, we, we have ignored this condition that is such a high prevalence condition with a high economic cost uh, as well as a high <coughs> social cost. It doesn't make sense. It really doesn't make sense. I mean, if this was a medical condition, this is sitting up there, you know, with, with um, the, uh, a lot of the cancers, mm. a lot of the cardiovascular diseases, and we wouldn't be then consigning those patients to some kind of, there's nothing we can do, you just got to go with it and get out of my hospital. Uh, you know, that's not the response that some, somebody with such a high prevalent and high cost disorder should have. So again... Um, I think we come back to why is, is partly, um, is a lot, about the fact that, that we don't get it. We've never understood this. And it's so amorphous and can present in so many different ways that it becomes too hard for the average clinician. I'm not going to go through all the symptoms because you guys are really the experts in this. I just wanted to draw, draw some of the, um, the things that people get very caught up with, which is the dissociation. And so many times we've seen people who the patient's actually dissociating in front of you um, when discussing something that is emotionally laden. And yet I've had other clinicians sitting with me going, see, she just doesn't care. I'm trying my damnedest, but she's tuned out. She just doesn't give us stuff. She's being really rude. She's being disrespectful. We're trying our hardest. So sometimes... You know, the symptoms are just so poorly understood mm. that the interpretation mm. then leads to another conflict um, mm. with, with, with the system. So there's a continual sort of cycle of trauma because of the way our systems are set up as well. And that invalidation is just escalating as the patient goes round and round um, um, in terms of the treatment. So we, we know about the rage and anger <coughs> and the fragile sense of self the impulsiveness and the contradictory feelings. This is the problem, the boundaries of a CTD, complex trauma disorder. So we prefer to describe that, but some people obviously have worked very hard to own the diagnosis of BPD, and if that's the case, then we go with that. But when I'm talking to the non 
uh, enlightened, mm -hmm. like this audience is the enlightened, when you talk to the non-enlightened, again, we drop back into bringing that word trauma in so that we get the, uh, the clinicians to focus on something other than personality disorder. Um, nonetheless, the problems of the boundaries of this condition. So today she's presenting with um, a bit of eating disorder and some rage and some self-harm that's expressed through the eating disorder or alcohol abuse. Tomorrow she looks a little bit manic. Um, the day after she's a bit, ma a bit um, depressed. And then she'll say those fatal words, I hear the voice, um, and then without inquiring what is going on with that, it, it is actually the voice of the stepfather in Emma's case who abused her. So it makes sense, you know, in a flashback kind of um, uh, PTSD way, but that, that takes about three or four other steps to get to, and it doesn't get there. It's psychosis before we know um, much more. Mm -hmm. So again, we have this very amorphous mixture of symptoms without a clear just two or three key things and that's you know that's where we're, we're at the other thing I might also raise with you is that the sort of group the group of people women that I see are obviously in higher functioning because I'm working in a an outpatient um, second second opinion clinic setting and uh, what we're finding is this relapse of symptoms that so uh, somebody might have that the horrible early trauma story somehow gets other positive influences that help her uh, develop relationships, develop a career, um, have children, kind of you know, hang in there. Still a lot of times there'll be anger or a bit of depression or a bit of this and that, but you know, she can keep it together and goes along and then at about 45, um, when the menopausal process starts between 40, about 43 in the, in, the, in the brain, there's a sudden relapse of, of it all. And of course, we can we can also talk about the context of the midlife changes um, you know, psychosocially as well as biologically. But we do see a number of women who, again, start the deliberate self harm, and uh, some of the behaviours that had disappeared uh, come back in, and everybody's quite shocked because um, you know she's been doing so well and and has held things together for quite a while. So <coughs> this is a complex disorder, very often very poorly misunderstood. Um, the low self-esteem, um, you know, the, the, the sort of if I, if I hurt myself, who bloody cares? Um, I'm going to do this to see whether people care. Um, that I deserve punishment, other side of the self-harm, self and the anger and rejection. The push-pull dynamic in the relationships, I'm desperate, desperate, desperate for, to be told that I'm loved, um, but when he gets to, what he or she gets too close, I'm going to test them out and I'll push them away and see what they do. And as therapists, it's going on with us as well. Um, I've heard Satya say many times um, that you know people with BPD can get better. We all see that if you're in the area, but try explaining that to clinicians who are not um, hanging in there with the patients who are just seeing you know Emma turn up for the 20th time this month with a Panadol overdose or, or um, slashing her wrists. There is a real sense of therapeutic nihilism still out there. Um, and so that brings us to what we're trying to do now. So when we look at all of these symptoms and we consider the trauma focus for the m majority of our clientele, and of course if they hadn't had early life trauma, then even the responses of the treating um, groups evoke trauma, you know, that, that it's not easy for, for people to keep going round and round that ED, psych ward sort of circuit. But when we think about all those things, it, this is a cognitive disturbance. The misperception, you know, I'll go and deliberately, I'll go and slash my wrist because she, she said or he said something really shocking and terrible. And when the emotion comes down, of course, the uh, logicality of what was said, it was not that bad, but at the time, that misinterpretation um, is a cognitive misperception of what is going on. And really we believe that the cognitive underpinning of all of these symptoms, uh, rather than um, more just a neurochemical um, psychotic or mood disorder uh, imbalance, is, is really underpinning this. So we, we thought, well, let's have a look at some of the pathophysiology in terms of the cognitive disturbances. And could we use this to then provide treatment for the condition? 
Now we know that the psychotherapies do work, and I've um, uh, I've seen you know, some great stuff that's done by Spectrum, by Satya, and other other really great therapists working through there. But one of the issues we have is the dialectical behavioural therapy, um, which has got this very um, cult status almost. You know, it's almost like you have to go and be blessed by Marsha Linehan. <laughs> yeah, um, it feels like you must only do it in this this way. Otherwise, you're not really delivering DBT. Um, and, of course, there's only a few people who are blessed by Marshall Linehan or done the exact sort of, um, you know, very operationalised way of delivering that. And that, that's great. But when we think about, let's go back to our approximately 19% of the population who have some of these symptoms, 6% very severely unwell, we don't have the trained therapist workforce to be able to handle that percentage of people. So particularly in the public sector, um, you know, there just isn't the resourcing to be able to do that. So this is one of the issues. It is effective, of course, the therapy is effective, but it's that hard staying, um, resourcing, intensive sort of input that's the issue. And sure, there are other types of therapy that are derivative of or have, have bits of, um, but again, it becomes that resource. There's, there's very, very good therapists who, you know, really their caseloads are already done by, by the time they've opened their books for, the, for two weeks. So we need to think about how we can harness the psychological therapies to their utmost efficiency. And we also need to fix the pharmacotherapy. You know, the, the pharmacotherapy, the drug usage, medication usage, I should say, in BPD is just a disaster. Um, it's an absolute shocker and you can almost make the diagnosis by the fact that if she has an antipsychotic prescribed, an antidepressant, a mood stabiliser and a benzodiazepine, she's got this condition pretty much. <laughs> and it's a real problem because every one of those medications has a side effect, big side effect, and that nobody seems to be good at taking people off drugs. You just seem to be really good at just laying on another layer upon another layer. And I'll show you why when we're looking at where we think this condition is, is coming from in terms of the biology of it, why the drugs that we use don't really work. And, of course, when the drugs don't work, that's another huge stigma. And often what happens is the patient will say, I can't take that antidepressant. It makes me feel nauseated. It makes me feel this, that, whatever it then comes back to bite her that, look, she's just such a pain, she's being manipulative, everything we've tried she will refute and, you know, that, that you can't treat her. And that adds to the therapeutic nihilism which goes on and on. So, again, with the etiology, we are thinking about the complex interaction of genetic, neurobiological and environmental. You could say that about any condition, um, and we should, because no condition is going to be just one thing. So we know that there are genetic issues in terms of the neurobiology. Um, we know that there are neurobiology changes, and I've, we've talked about trauma, but there are other environmental factors as well. So again, um, the, the writing that's been done has been looking at childhood trauma, actual cruelty, neglect, and brutality by parents, but it can be softer than that as well. It doesn't, that's, that's the you know, severe end of the spectrum, but it can be softer. Um, one of the things that, that concerns me is I'm, I'm seeing younger and younger um, girls, and you know, they are girls because we're seeing them at about 11 to 13, and there's this lost child um, sort of stuff going on where parents have, have really got very involved in their new lives, have separated, there's all kinds of chaos going on in both directions, and here is somebody who's who describes being lost between new developing um family homes and so on. So, you know, that sort of problematic schism again leads to some of the attachment issues and if there is a genetic underpinning for this kind of condition to erupt, then we've just added another huge stress um, into the whole system. So, again, you know, the trauma, abuse, whether, what sort of abuse or <coughs> trauma that it is, leading to the ongoing stress, leading to PTSD or chronic stress type symptoms, which then leads to the self-harm, rage, relationship and work issues. And I should have another arrow going back up to further re-traumatising. And that's what we're seeing is, 
is trauma, re-trauma, re-trauma upon re-trauma. I've got to say another soapbox that I'm on, I'm on two soapboxes, this is one, but then the other soapbox is how we manage women in our inpatient units. Yep. Um, it is an absolute crime mm -hmm. um, that we are seeing women in our high dependency units being raped as we speak. The Mental Health Complaints Commission has commissioned me to work with them on this issue because the number of assaults, including actual rape, physical assault, emotional assault, um, fear, has really escalated. As you can imagine, as we've got more and more acutely unwell people in our system, um, people intoxicated with ice and other, that the disinhibited behaviours is really bad and the uh, amount of, um, the number of assaults on women has escalated. And of course you can just imagine which patients are going to be um, the ones who are more likely to be assaulted, are the ones who act out in some way and who get put in HDU as an almost sort of pun punitive um, strategy. But often um, the HDU is, you know, where one woman said, I couldn't get out, I can't get out if I'm in the HDU can't defend myself if I'm drugged up with um, sed sedating drugs. And you, you, you see this in, in hospital system after hospital system. It's not just one place. So this is a huge issue in terms of what's going on with re-traumatisation of our patient <coughs> populations. So <coughs> they can be raped by co-patients. Co-patients. Co co-patients. Mm -hmm. Because we manage men and women together mm -hmm. in our inpatient units. That's been the case since the 1960s. So, um, you know, and I've, I've got another three hour lecture that I can give on that and can present you with the data, but it is an absolute um, betrayal, institutional betrayal of women who are in care and expecting and should, should get care. So this is another whole issue. So I'll come back to, to this soapbox, which is about the biological issues in BPD. I passionately believe in the biopsychosocial model. It's about that holistic view. We mustn't forget about the biology, and in some, sometimes in conditions like this, there's really good psychosocial work that's done, but the biology gets kind of missed, and, and the psychopharmacology or the medications are abysmal. I mean, the, 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 the treatment has just been awful. Treatment has been mainly psychological and has been patchy, because it again depends on whether the, the person can afford or access really, you know, sophisticated psychological treatments or the actual DBT programs and so on. So, and, and again, the trauma, which is the social environmental factors, often are sort of swept under the carpet as well. So let's have a look at the bio for a, a bit. Um, one of the things that we've learned about brain development is that um, childhood brain development, and it continues on in through adolescence and into early adulthood. So brain development's not done and dusted by age five or six or seven. Um, different parts of the brain develop at different rates. And so if there are assaults or traumas um, of different types that happen at different stages, then different sorts of um, in, incapacities and different problems um, arrive because it depends on which brain development phase the young person is at. And adolescence is also a time of brain development and we sometimes forget that, that things that go on in, in adolescence are also significant. So we were I was taught when I was doing um, psychiatry training about 500 years ago that you know, you really took a careful history of all that sort of breastfeeding, bottle feeding, crawling, talking those milestones and steps and then it was sort of like yep done by five which is completely ridiculous yeah. but um, this is a really important um, issue because the disruptions in, the, in all of these different systems feed back onto each other and uh, one of the things that we've been looking at a lot is glutamate so you've heard of the serotonin system clearly with the antidepressant medication, SSRIs, working through the serotonin system. We know about the dopamine system um, in schizophrenia, but the glutamate system is the main cognitive symptom or the cognitive uh, driver in the brain. It's actually where brain plasticity comes from too, is the, is the glutamate system. So in what I hearken back to, with I started talking about the cognitive 
issues in this condition, particularly the misperception of other people's comments, the poor self-esteem, the inability to put things into perspective, the incapacity to hold um, good concepts about self and so on, are cognitive impairments. So we think the glutamate system is probably a critical path of what's going on. Now, don't panic, I'm not going to go into my NMDA receptor and glutamatergic um, neurobiology in too much detail, but the glutamatergic system, in particular the NMDA subtype receptor, has a major, major role in the um, development of cognition and memory and is also experience depend dependent neuroplasticity plasticity depends on the NMDA receptor systems. So again, if there are if there are issues with this system, all of these different processes are then affected. So putting all of this together, and this is a big um, theoretical bioetiology, what we think is going on is that there is not just one-off stress um, that has happened, but chronic stress. So again, we, we know about the patterns of where, and Emma, who I presented earlier, you know, the trauma was, was consistent for between 8 and 14. So it's not uncommon that there's chronic sort of traumas. So this chronic stress first creates um, the glutamate overactivity so that you get um, through the cortisol system, because cortisol is here, is the neuroendocrine marker, um, through the adrenal axis with elevated cortisol and then completely... Um, dysregulated feedback mechanism. So the cortisol system is basically stuffed and not responding as, as it would normally respond, which is the stress hormone diathesis. So from that, and cortisol is one of the key drivers of a lot of the other brain transmitter systems, so you've got elevated cortisol and then dysregulated feedback um, systems. So this is somebody who's always got a high level of anxiety, no matter how everything else is panning out. This is a person who lives you know, almost in this kind of state of having everything very hyper and is often jumpy and, and very anxious about things. Um, from there, the cortisol turns up the glutamate system, so that then starts to misfire and be absolutely uh, running at an all-time high as well. And from that, there are cognitive symptoms that, that are not developing as one would normally like, memory symptoms, People have done things like look at actual brain imaging and found that the, the memory um, circuits in the hippocampus are sh shrunken and so on, mm -hmm. all through the glutamate cognitive system. The other neuroendocrine system, that's hormone systems, is to feed back onto the gonadal axis. So in our women, a number of women have this condition called polycystic ovarian syndrome, mm -hmm. where you don't have to have cysts on the ovary, mm -hmm. but what happens is there's a rapid weight gain or there's an increased propensity for obesity, um, even though the diet may not be as bad or whatever it is, but there's obesity, diabetes, um, insulin problems, hair, and then of course, hair and hair problems, facial hair, hairiness, and that can be also very bad acne, so it doesn't necessarily have to be hair. Um, and then, of course, there can also be the infertility that can result as, that, as far as that. But the other thing is, because this axis, the gonadal axis, is implicated, we find that whenever the estrogen levels drop, things get worse, the symptoms get worse. So this is why there's often a premenstrual exacerbation. So premenstrual depression is very common. And then, of course, the menopausal relapse that I described earlier on, which is when estrogen levels really drop. Um, again, that can be explained in terms of the flare up there. The other thing that happens when there is this very high level of cortisol and then dysregulated cortisol systems is that we're, we're measured and measuring a lot of the autoimmune systems um, go haywire as well. So these are patients who often experience the worst kind of flu, um, glandular fever, a whole lot of those infective processes or um, uh, autoimmune conditions like um, uh, you know, neuro, uh, fibromyalgias, um, various kinds of weird aches and pains, and also different sensitivity to drugs, our medications. So, you know, that, that story of when she said, I feel sick when I take this, this and this, and everyone goes, yeah, yeah, she's just been a pain. 
is actually got a basis in the biology because it is altered, that there is a, a difference in the drug sensitivities as well. So as you can see, you know, from the cascade of the stress and the cortisol adrenal axis becoming dysfunctional in early life, there are many, many ramifications in terms of biology. But a lot of the work that we're looking at is in this particular neurotransmitter. So this might also explain why the SSRIs, the SNRIs, you know, the venlafaxines, the Prozacs and um, the antipsychotics are not really hitting the mark because they're actually not working on the glutamate system. The medications that do work currently <coughs> in the glutamate system is Topamax or Topiramate and Lamotrigine or Lamictal. But Lamictal only in slow, a small doses because once Lamictal goes into the range that normally is prescribed for mood stabilisation, it stops working as well on the glutamate system. So again, we always tend to, uh, clinicians always think, oh, if a little bit's good, then more must be better. Not the case. And um, topiramate, of course, also has a rebound anxiety if it's prescribed in um, too high a dose. So again, we've got to be mindful that this is somebody whose drug sensitivities are altered. So our best bets are to use really tiny, tiny doses of, of either of those. Could I ask a question? Sure. Um, you described this sort of arrow of causality and biological terms. If, if somebody were to have perhaps long-term um, good treatment, psychological yes. treatment, yes. Um, is there likely to be any change yes. in what this thing yeah, Absolutely. Okay. Because this is very responsive to, it, it's, it governs the neuroplasticity of the brain. So if you do give somebody the, you know, the calm environment and lots of positive reassurance and reinforcement, um, you know, keep everything that you can to less trauma, then over time, the, the brain is plastic, but it's the glutamate system that's driving that particular change, which is which is why the psychotherapies do work. I mean, they, there is a biological basis to why the psychotherapies work. There is no doubt that, that they, they do work. The problem is if there's continuing chronic stress because of psychological or environmental stress, if that's continuing, it's kind of buttressing up against what the good changes are from the other side. So. Um, Things like meditation, yoga, I mean, they're all shown to have impacts on the glutamate system, positive impacts on the glutamate system. Um, so certainly the, the brain being plastic is, is the best news that we could possibly have as therapists. Um, so that's, that's the summary of, of the glutamate signaling. But once we start thinking about glutamate signaling, it, should, it can and does shift our focus in a biological sense to the glutamate system. And what that means is away from the serotonin and dopamine systems and to think twice, three times, four times about why we use all the other drugs that are really not hitting the mark, as she's telling you. Um, our patients tell us this, this is not really doing much. They might get a little bit of um, some response if there's an overlying other condition like a major depression um, or the severe agitation, but it's not getting to the heart of the matter. So we are looking at now focusing our attention onto NMDA antagonist drugs because the NMDA, NMDA receptor, as I was saying, drives the glutamate system. So let's see if we can actually do something at that level. And um, you know about the good story of ketamine in very difficult to treat depressions. Ketamine is a very useful mm -hmm. medication, but it's got problems because people dissociate on ketamine. So we didn't want to do that in this population who are dissociating anyway. So hence, uh, I've been looking at memantine, which is a form of ketamine, but it doesn't have the dissociation. It's a current drug that's out there for Alzheimer's disease. It's a cognitive enhancing drug. Um, so again, we're using it to try and look at cognitive processing and glutamate turn down. The key, though, is when you can use this in combination, so small numbers, 47 and this is the graph that shows the symptoms. Sorry, I can't. <coughs> this is using the BEST, which is the um, borderline evaluation severity over time symptoms. And again, with the memantine on board, 
um, we see a, a, a very interesting decrease in the symptoms, particularly the deliberate self-harm and the dissociation symptoms. Um, but the best combo is if you can use this with um, psychotherapy that is meaningful to the person. Um, because what you're actually doing then is you're allowing the neurotransmitter systems to calm down, and this is, you know, the neuroendocrinologists will kill me for talking like this, but <coughs> to calm down enough to allow the concepts and the work that's being done in psychotherapy to hit home. Because often, you know, with that really agitated situation, um, the best therapists in the world can, you know, not really only just contain during some of that crisis, which is, which is also important, but not to really get through with some of the other concepts. And some of the other um, things that we've found is that um, people have said things like, you know, I've still got all the, the crap, as the patient said, I've still got all the crap to deal with, but I just find that I can put it a bit more in perspective. It's not a huge shift, but it can just allow her to just have a bit more mastery over what is usually out of control for, for her. And that's the other part about it too. Like, you know, we, we've seen people who say things like, I don't, I don't feel like I need to run away from my, my therapy sessions. Um, you know, I feel like I can actually hang in there. So there's all those different sorts of softer things that I think are really important. And also, at the very least, if we can actually stop people from prescribing those four or five other different psychotropics, then at least we're stopping the multiplying effect of the increased obesity because of Zyprexa or... Um, the fact that she's just so zombied that you know no therapy is getting through um, because there's just you know, there's just nothing going on. Um, the other thing I have another soap, soapbox, and it's probably part of this soapbox, is that bloody awful bipolar type two diagnosis. So many times we've said we feel like we run a depolarization clinic. People come in <laughs> with bipolar type two and then they leave with a different a different understanding of the condition. Bipolar type 2, you know, you will have all seen the patients we're talking about. And they come in and they talk about the manic episode. And when you break it down, you try and actually get to the details. And it's not a manic episode by what we, what we really see as manic episodes. What she'll say is, one day I had a bit more energy and I cleaned the house or mm -hmm. I, um, yeah. I... And the other one, wonderful thing is I went shopping. You go, lovely, what did you buy? I bought myself an outfit and I bought myself some makeup and my doctor said that that's manic spending. And you're thinking, no, <laughs> no, no, no. So we, we, um, we often find that men don't understand shopping. <laughs> <laughs> so we always start again with the what did you buy, what, what was it about, the contextual story for the shopping. And when you go through symptom by symptom by symptom, many times it is not a manic um, situation, it's either in reaction to a, a new antidepressant, and we know that these women carry a sensitivity, so that sudden burst of serotonin can actually cause an aberration in behaviour, or it can be sometimes that she's not felt well for so long that she's forgotten what yeah. well or normal feels like, and that's the other, that's the other problem we have as well. So I, I'm... I'd say stay tuned because we're still recruiting. Um, interestingly, and, and thanks to um, Sakya and our colleagues out at Spectrum, we, we've not had problems getting people into the study. So we, in fact, have the other problem. We have a vast number of people who want to come into the study. It's, it's males and females in the study. Um, but I, I just think we, you know, what we've been doing for people like Emma has been disgraceful in our general system. We've got pockets of expertise. You, you have... You know, that expertise, which is wonderful, but there aren't that many of you, um, and there's a lot of Emma's in the world. Mm -hmm. So um, I'll leave it there and take some questions. Yes, when you talk about the lamotrigine, what exactly is it treating when it's prescribed in a low dose? In the low doses, it's working through the glutamate system. It's working through not, not directly the NMDA, but one of the other, um, there's three subreceptor types, so it's working through one of the other subreceptors. But once it gets past about 50 milligrams, then it's saturated that 
receptor. So it's, it's then not working at that site. It then starts to have other effects. So, it, you know, we, we forget that drugs have a therapeutic window. And if you undershoot or if you overshoot, it doesn't have the effect that you want. So more is not better. It's a common sort of belief. You're just mentioning that in a study, both in, um, females and males, yes. is there any difference in the sense of, of you know, the response. male kind of response to these things? Yeah. Do you know, it's, it's really um, <coughs> the dissociation. Um, our, our male customers have described um, much more profound dissociation mm. and then a profound response to mm. the mantine mm. of the dissociation. And we've had um, people saying things like, I just didn't know that I mean, he, he, this, this wonderful description by this young man who said, I sort of looked at my hands and I realised that they were part of my body and that, my, and that I could mm -hmm. feel my arms and I could mm -hmm. feel my legs. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't realised that that was um, actually part of my body. Mm -hmm. And then we had another person who said, I looked in the mirror and I actually recognised that that was me looking back and that, that sort of dissociation. Mm -hmm. um, Sad bits, we're getting a lot of people who have been in boarding schools and uh, boys, mm. when they were boys, who are now men. Um, so they describe a lot of dissociation mm. because of that's what they, they, that's how they dealt with sexual yeah. abuse. Yeah. Mm. So it's interesting that the mantine's been very uh, mm. useful. For the women, what we've seen more is the uh, control um, mm. of the urge to deliberately self-harm. Mm. So that's been interesting because it's like that step back, which of course you're seeing with your, you know, your <coughs> patient who's engaged in, in good therapy as well. Yeah. So it's a bit more of that sort of different mm. response. Mm. And that's that cosmic yeah. plasticity again, you know, a different, yeah. And the idea that the long-termness of therapy, you know, compared to with the aid of something like yeah. this would make a massive difference, yeah. And, and we also, mm. you know, we, we've seen some really Good work by some of the general practitioners mm. too. That 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 very kindly GP who's a constant figure in mm. the person's life who tolerates the, the some of the mm. behaviours and so on. And again, there's that sort of trajectory mm. of, of improvement. 